a pint of Burton's Best. Delicious. Burton on Trent is known throughout the world for its fine ales, but there's more to Burton than the barley, the barrels and the beer. History begins with a handful of true ancient Britons driven from their farming meadows of the valley by a tribe of Celts called the Cornovii. When the Romans arrived sometime after 43 AD, it was probably these Celts who helped them build a road leading to a fort at Little Chester near Derby. This ran parallel to the modern day A38, passing via Wellington Street, Derby Street and Derby Road. It reached and crossed the River Dove at Stretton a name which itself means settlement on a Roman road. In 410 AD, the Roman legions decamped and moved out, leaving the British to face the attacks of the Anglo-Saxons, who were working their way into the Midlands along the rivers. By the 6th century, Britain's lands were overrun with Saxons, and they marked their chosen settlements with the suffix tun, Old English for village or enclosure. The name Burton means armory town, and stocks of weapons, horses and provisions were hoarded for the Saxon kings of Mercia as they waged war on their neighbours. At the end of the 7th century, an Irish abbess called Madwena stopped in the town on her way to Rome. But the stayover must have been much longer than she expected because she built a church here on Andersea. During the seven years of her stay, people talked of the miracle cures from the hay water taken from her well. And, as legend spread, pilgrims flocked here to St Modwena's Shrine here on Andrasi Island. Upon her return from Rome, Modwena built a church on the other side of the river in honour of St Peter and St Paul, on the site of the present day St Peter's Church at Stadenhill. Designed by Evans and Jolly, it was built by the Burton firm of Thomas Lowe and Sons in 1881. In the year 1004, a Benedictine abbey was founded in Burton by Wolfric Spott, a Mercian nobleman with royal connections and son of Queen Wolfruna, who founded Wolverhampton. A few relics of the abbey are still visible, like the chapter house doorway where the abbot would preside over the manor court. As lord of the manor, the abbot held the power to hang any thieves caught on his 70 manors. If any of the monks were ill, they came here to the Abbey's infirmary where today quite a different kind of medicine is on prescription. Lying to the west of Burton is Shobnall, a village that prospered as a farming community where the monks of Burton Abbey would cultivate their extensive lands from Shobnall Grange. The Grange was once home to the ancient family of Shobnall and was later given to the Abbey as Sinai Park Farm. The moat is possibly the oldest part of the structure, dating from 1334, when, as a country house, it was used as a hunting lodge. 
It later became a holiday home for the monks who were allowed to go there three times a year, as well as a home to convalesce after their compulsory bloodletting. The name Sinai is a corruption of an old French word meaning holiday and nothing to do with the biblical Mount Sinai. The house fell into disrepair and has been empty since the Second World War, although the present owner is now renovating it. William the Conqueror is known to have come to Staffordshire twice, in 1069 and 1070 to stamp out rebellions. And in 1085, King William ordered the survey which became known as the Doomsday Book. Burton was still underdeveloped, and his population was shown as smaller than that of Stretton, although the scribe mistakenly described it as Stafford instead of Burton. Wouldn't it be nice if the taxman did that today? Many of the inhabitants had to work the abbey lands in return for holding their own land. 1204 was a year of importance for Burton. King John granted a charter to make one borough at Burton and all liberties and free customs pertaining to a borough. As a result, Burton's trade and population flourished. Fleet Street became a maze of little lanes running between the cottages and workshops of the craftsmen whose livelihoods depended on the abbey. Abbey records show, however, that many of the houses were destroyed by a fire which swept through the town in 1254. Way back in 1204, King John granted to Abbot William Melbourne the right to hold a three-day fair on the vigil, feast and morrow of St Modwin at the beginning of October. And this feast still lives on today, although the menu consists largely of candy floss and hot dogs. The people of Burton have been enjoying its statutes fair for nearly 800 years. And in the early part of this century, many of the rides were manufactured by a local firm, as Mrs Gladys Shipton recalls. On the Dollar Bridge, there used to be Grouts Cooperage, and at the side of there, at the back of there, used to be the, the um, Orton and Spooners. And they used to build the, the Wall of Death and also the roundabouts for the statues. Well, when when they'd finished them, they used to put them on the, on the site at the side of the Dalla Bridge and fetch all we children for, to test them. We used to clamber all over them and, and ride on them as much as we liked and as much rough dealing as possible. But the statutes wasn't just a fair, but a place to hire workers. Again, Mrs Shipton. They used to come in from the country because and they used to give them a shilling when they were hired and I've been with them when they've been hired. And uh, they used to get the maids for the housework and, and the uh, men for the fields and they used to give them all a shilling. That was a lot of money in those days. As well as giving permission to have a fair, King John also granted a weekly Thursday market. Although the first market hall was not built until the 15th century. This was demolished in 1772 to be replaced by a town hall, also with market stalls. This was subsequently replaced by the present market hall, which was opened in 1883. At the entrance to the marketplace would stand Chippy Heap, the first man in Burton to sell chips even though they were meticulously counted out. The market was a hive of local activity, with fish sold from wooden stalls in an open-fronted slate roof shed. Up to 40 pigs were slaughtered each day in what today is the chic Abbey Arcade. When Henry VIII appointed himself head of the Church of England, he ordered the dissolution of the monasteries. They were sacked, the treasures were stolen, priests were killed and the lands were seized. Monks and nuns were accused of immorality, but on three visitations to Burton Abbey at the time of Abbot William Bain, they found no evidence of this. The third prior, William Edis, was finally forced to surrender the abbey in 1539, making it the last abbey in Staffordshire to be dissolved and marking the end of monastic life in Burton. The statue of St Modwin was removed, sent to Thomas Cromwell, never to be seen again. Chief Secretary to the King was Sir William Paget, who became the new Lord of the Manor, and successive generations of the Paget family also, as the Earls of Uxbridge and Marquess of Anglesey, owned much of the property in the town until it was sold in the 20th century. 
While the Roman road Ricknield Street crossed the River Dove at Clay Mills, the first bridge across the River Trent was not built until the early 11th century. The first bridge was 15 feet wide and 515 yards long, with regular recesses for pedestrians as it curved its way across the river. The bridge has seen its fair share of battles. In 1322, Thomas, 2nd Earl of Lancaster, fortified the bridge in the hope of stopping King Edward II from advancing northward. Lancaster retreated and was finally defeated in Yorkshire and executed on the 22nd of March. The monks initially took responsibility for maintenance of the bridge, but following the dissolution of the monasteries, it also was granted to the Paget family. The Earl of Uxbridge turnpiked the road in 1753 and in 1831 widened the bridge to 26 feet. By the 17th century, Burton was surging ahead with prospering clothing, malting and brewing trades, only to be quelled by a raging civil war. Although there was little enthusiasm amongst local people for either side, Burton was important to both royalist and parliamentary forces because the River Trent forms a boundary across central England, and way back in the 17th century, the only crossing point for miles around was here. Armed with muskets and pikes, both sides battle hard and long to keep control of the bridge, which changed hands no less than eight times in two and a half years. Lord Paget, initially a parliamentarian, switched his allegiance to the king, and in 1643 formed a regiment of foot soldiers, many of the men coming from his estates. The parishioners couldn't even pray in safety. Two barrels of gunpowder, stored in the old abbey church, exploded, bursting the windows and roof. The damage was, however, nothing in comparison to the devastation, misery and poverty that faced the town over the 50 years or so it took to recover. By the beginning of the 18th century, Burton was a small market town, populated by about two and a half thousand people, living in timber-framed houses like this, along High Street, Bond End, New Street and Horninglow Street. A new chapter in the town's history was heralded when Lord Paget secured an Act of Parliament to make the River Trent navigable between Burton and Shardlow. The Trent navigation acted as a life force, bringing trade and wealth to the town still in the infancy of its growth. A wharf and warehouses were built at Bond End to handle the boats and cargoes, and contact with the already advanced Birmingham made the mid-1700s a time of opportunity. The next chapter in our Burton story opens with the year 1777, and a milestone which would shape the town's future. The Trent and Mersey Grand Trunk Canal was opened to its full length through Burton. Local entrepreneurs didn't hesitate to take full advantage of the export and import opportunities provided by it. Horninglow Wharf became a hub of small industrial development. Warehouses alongside and over the canal stored cheese, hardware, coal, lead, millstones, timber and salt, all heading downstream in an effort that would end Burton's commercial isolation. Robert Parsley Peel, a mill owner and grandfather of the famous Prime Minister, moved from Lancashire to Burton in 1780 after his workforce rioted at the introduction of the spinning jenny. He immediately set up a mill near the old corn mill in Newton Road, the first of five in the town, which at their peak employed 425 people, of whom 100 were children. The family lived here, at Peel House in Litchfield Street. The art of brewing has been known to mankind itself since the first wild yeast settled on the wet grain and produced a notable and potent result. In Burton, the monks were the first to discover the unique qualities of Burton's water. It is naturally gypsum enriched to give a bright, clear pint with a distinctive taste. In the early days, ale was brewed in individual public houses for their own consumption. The first brewer in the town to offer his beer for general sale was Thomas Printon, who established his brewery near the Three Queens in 1708. It gradually became evident that brewing on a larger scale was more economic, and between 1740 and 1777, the number of brewers in the town increased to 15. Allsop's brewery grew from a public house brewery established by Benjamin Wilson in 1748. Henry Allsop, the prominent local figure, was the great-grandson of the founder. William Worthington, a cooper, brought Joseph Smith's brewery here at 146 High Street. In 1777, William Bass bought his premises at 136 High Street, with a brew house behind it. 
Little did he know what he'd started. For under the succession of Michael, his son, by 1820, Bass had grown to be the largest brewery in Burton, a position which it still holds to this day. In 1819, Worthington's amalgamated with Evans Brewery, finally joining forces with Bass in 1927. Also stimulated by the excellence of Burton's water and the town's reputation, Edward Ind, under the directorship of George and William Coop of Romford, bought their Station Street premises next to Allsop's Brewery. Commercial logic dictated that Incoop and Allsop should join forces, and in 1934 the knot was tied between them to form Incoop Burton Brewery, another prime mover in the brewing industry. The Industrial Revolution spawned many great things, great inventions, great industries, but above all, the great thirst. So in 1856, Mr. Ind and Mr. Coop decided that all this industry deserved a better plant. Their high standards can still be appreciated today in Ind Coop's Burton Ale. So when you've earned a great pint, you deserve to go for a Burton. Marston's, or Marston, Thompson and Evershed Limited, were formed in 1905 by a merger of successful 19th century brewers. John Marston began malting in 1823, then brewing with his sons at this site on the corner of Horninglow Road, Dover Road and Ralston Road in 1834. The Marstons merged with the Yeoman Brewery based at the Blue Posts in 1890. John Thompson occupied a small brewery at the rear of the Bear Inn in Horninglow Street, now part of Anson Court. A brewing victualler and baker, he purchased an ancient brewery adjoining the premises in 1846, ending up with these fine premises. The familiar Albion Brewery in Sharpnell, built by Mann, Crossman and Paulin in 1875, became vacant in 1898 and in this year, Marston's amalgamated with Thompson's and moved to their current premises. The Evershed Brewery completed a complex series of mergers by joining Marston, Thompson and Son in 1905. Strangely enough, the jovial, avuncular figure of John Marston seen in the adverts is purely an artist's impression, as no picture of him has ever been found. Remember when Britannia ruled the waves? My, what a team we had back then. Boots, Wellington, Charlie Dickens, <laughs> Dangerous Darwin, Nobler Nightingale, Bomber Brunel, good old John Marston. John, who ruled a master? A great Victorian bloke he brought as bastards. The finest tales from Castlewood ruled the Burton Union way. Something's are what they used to be. Marston still pride themselves on brewing the world-renowned pedigree ale by the traditional Burton Union method. Carrington's built a brewery in Abbey Street, and the Leopard Inn was their brewery pub. Although brewing ceased in 1926, the Charrington's name can still be seen dimly on the fascia at the top. Between the years of 1807 and 1869, the number of breweries in Burton rose from one to a staggering 26. These included Truman, Hanbury and Buxton at the Black Eagle Brewery in Derby Street, the Crescent Brewery, Robinson, Salt, Bindley, Darson and Edie, and Boddington. Walkers and Everards also built breweries in Burton between 1877 and 1885, but with Everards move to Leicester, the Heritage Brewery continued to fill surplus demand. It closed when the demand dried up, leaving these derelict premises, and the distinctive goat maltings which belonged to the Walker Brewery of Wrexham.
The opening of the Trent and Mersey Canal had given access to new markets in England and overseas. But transport costs, delays and theft made the beers expensive outside a 15-mile radius of the town. The strong, sweet Burton Ale was better appreciated abroad than in Britain, and both Peter the Great and Empress Catherine of Russia are said to have been very fond of a jar or two. The blockade caused by the raging French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars killed the town's export business, and by 1822 the Baltic trade was virtually at an end. Burton's brewers had to look for some new markets. In 1823, Samuel Alsop began developing an India Pale Ale, based on a product pioneered by London brewer Mark Hodgson. After his initial experiments, brewed in a teapot, a clear, light product was developed, which became very popular in Burton, as well as India. Within 15 years, Bass and Alsop had almost monopolised the market. The railway came to Burton in 1839, and the age of steam suddenly yielded a quicker and cheaper means of distribution, which in turn created a new Burton. To accommodate such an increase in business, large brewery buildings were constructed between the town and the main railway line, linked together by numerous private branch lines, also opened by the breweries. Prior to the 1860s, breweries sent their casks of ale to the main goods stations and made deliveries by horse and a one-ton floater. Bass held on to this tradition and were known to send a fully loaded dray up Ashby Road to Leicester, pulled by the magnificent Shire horses. By 1900, a staggering 87 miles of private track and a number of sidings saw 25 ale trains leaving Burton each day, with some 31 breweries producing between them some 3,500,000 barrels of laughing brew per year. However, the disruption caused by the trains was phenomenal. Private lines cut across all the major streets, with a total of 32 level crossings. Imagine the frustration of shoppers when Station Street had to be crossed three times. Horninglow, Guild, Litchfield, New and Park Streets each twice. The work was hard, and the hours were long. During most of the 19th century, the basic working week was 60 hours. Perhaps the hardest job was that of the maltster, who turned wet grain like hitting concrete at temperatures of up to 55 degrees Celsius. In school holidays, children would prick holes in the malting floor tiles, each containing 960 holes for a penny a tile. One familiar symbol of Burton is the cooper. Making wooden barrels was a skilled craft, mainly passed on from father to son and requiring a five-year apprenticeship. The demand for coopers dwindled at the end of the 19th century with the introduction of the machine-operated steam cooperage and almost disappeared after 1960 when metal barrels were introduced. However, the skill has not died. Marston's present-day cooper, Harry Finch. My great-grandfather was a cooper, so there was a mist of two generations. But my middle son, he's a cooper. I t uh, he served his time under me up at Manchester. Well, it, it is hard work and it's, uh, it, it can never be anything else but hard work. But what, we, what I do here is all the casts with the broken, the old casts with the broken staves, I re, if they're too far gone, I replace them with a new one, which is like this. The, the shell, or the body, that's already made. But I, I make all the heads by hand, cut them in by hand, and I check what they call chime and crozen myself here because they're all different lengths. So if you had them ready made, there's, there's an old... On the new sets, you could have them all the same, but on the old sets, you vary in length. So you have to make the new one according to it. And, of course, there was an initiation ceremony at the end of the Cooper's apprenticeship. You had to make your own cask, and then you were... Uh, placed in it while it was hot, it was put over the cresset and fired and then it was trussed while you were in it and then they rolled you around the yard covered you in what's it, shavings, beer, soot and all, everything that they could that could do with coopering you got it over you Apart from the hard maltings work however during the early part of the century working for the brewery spelt security and a congenial way to earn a living rates of pay conditions and sound amenities were all favourable in contrast to other industries. 
Brewery wages were fixed at between one and two shillings above agricultural workers' weekly wages. Plus, if you work for the breweries, you could expect excellent social and recreational facilities and assistance during ill health. Nearly all the major breweries ran regular excursions to the coast for their employees. With no shadow of a doubt, the most famous were the legendary bus trips, which merited not only local but national press, and grew to such proportion that at its height, 17 trains were needed to convey 11,000 passengers to the larger resorts of Blackpool, Scarborough, Yarmouth and Liverpool, the only places that could take such large numbers. In addition to receiving a full day's pay, each worker was given five shillings spending money. This note shows how one prudent employee budgeted his money. But what I want to know is who was Nell and was she worth it? Like a lot of other employers during this era, the breweries built houses for their workers and because the Industrial Revolution came later to Burton than most other towns, the worst excesses of poor housing associated with this period were to a large extent avoided. Land was not so scarce and there were few back-to-back -back terraces. Slum areas have long since been removed and what remains are solidly constructed buildings from the Victorian and Edwardian eras. A flourishing brewery trade saw the town's population swell fivefold, from just 6,000 in 1840 to 30,000 at the turn of the century. Many of the brewers aspired to more domestic splendour, and several of the fine houses in and around Burton were built by brewing families. Formark Hall, home to the Allsop family. Berkeley Lodge, where Michael Thomas Bass lived. And the splendid Rangemore Hall, home to Michael Arthur Bass who, when he received his peerage, became Lord Burton in 1886. Billy Bass, who also lived at Berkeley Lodge, gambled away all his money and even had to sell the contents of the house to pay his gambling debts. When he held a party, he had to hire furniture for the day from a local auctioneer. Newton Park Hall, now a hotel, was built by Abraham Hoskins. Needwood Manor, also a hotel, home to the Buckley family and the Clay family after whom the street in Stapenhill is named. Its water tower has crosses built in to ensure the purity of the water. The breweries in turn gave rise to a whole range of associated industries, offering a time of opportunity for men like Thomas Thornerwill. He began manufacturing spades and other metal tools in his hardware business in New Street and in 1755 operated a forge and ironworks at Clay Mills. The family bought Dovecliffe House and prospered from the manufacture of iron castings, brewery locomotives and colliery engines. Towards the end of the 1880s, the firm were kept busy engineering two of the town's bridges. For Stapen Hill folk, the only way to reach Burton without a very long walk was to catch the ferry across the Trent. The ferryman, who lived in this cottage, charged a halfpenny to carry you across the river and if he didn't feel like turning out he didn't and that was it the completion of the ferry bridge a magnificent example of Victorian construction was a gift from Lord Burton The day it opened saw the closure of the ferry service, and the ferry's last trip carried civic dignitaries across the river, marking the end of an era. The Andersey Bridge not only provides the town with a link to the Washlands, but also to its past, St Modwin's Orchards. The firm of Thorniewell and Wareham supplied steam engine locomotives to many of the breweries. The only steam locomotive which has been preserved for posterity is the loco that can still be seen today outside the Bass Museum. It is very apt that this was chosen, as it is the same engine and carriage that carried King Edward VII around Burton when he visited in 1902 as the guest of Lord Burton at Rangemore Hall. Inevitably, steam was gradually replaced by diesel or petrol locomotives, and the breweries turned to the expertise of another local manufacturer to furnish them with the goods. The Rick Neild Engine Company had been manufacturing trucks and cars in Shobnell Street since 1902. 
An optimistic production target of 150 vehicles per week was never achieved. In fact, it's likely they didn't even make this many vehicles in a year. The company changed name to Bagley Drury Limited, moved to Clarence Street and concentrated their efforts and expertise on producing diesel and petrol locomotives which it exported to all four corners of the world. Every beer bottle has its own distinctive label and the first firm to specialise in printing these labels was formed by William Butterfield Darley in 1827 at 35 High Street. In 1960 the firm moved to Wellington Street and changed its name to Darley Business Forms. One business which developed its trade from brewing is Marmite, which began manufacturing Cross Street in 1902. Marmite is made using the spent yeast from the fermentation process. The recipe and method are a closely guarded secret, but remain unchanged from the start of the century. In 1930, Bovril Limited took over the Marmite Food Extract Company, and both products are now manufactured at a modern factory in Wellington Road. Both products are exported all over the world, and because Marmite is vegan and kosher approved, every year a Jewish rabbi blesses the factory and makes sure that all kosher standards are met. Spent brewery grain had for a long time been used for animal feed, and Romenko, based in Derby Road, pioneered the scientific production of feedstuffs, now supplying its products all over the world. Prominent Bertonian businessmen dominated local government in the 19th century, and it's appropriate that the town's first mayor was a brewer, William Worthington, who was appointed in 1878. The present town hall was built in three parts at different dates. The clock tower, and left-hand section, originally built as St Paul's Parish Institute and Liberal Club, were given to the town by Lord Burton in 1894. He added the part to the right of the clock tower, which included the council chamber, in the same year. The third building, designed by local architect Thomas Jenkins, was opened in October of 1939. King Edward Place, as its name denotes, is a pleasant example of Edwardian planning and brewery owners' benefice. This area was laid out following an earlier visit by King Edward VII, who had apparently commented on the meanness of the street in front of the town hall. Naturally, such a blow to the town's reputation couldn't be taken for long, and Lord Burton kindly offered £4,000 towards the cost for improvement to the street, and the result was St Paul's Square and Church. Lord Burton hoped that the town would one day become a city, and this would be its cathedral. Although Burton isn't a city yet, Lord Burton would be proud to know that his area constitutes Burton's first conservation area. The Evershed family produced many keen sportsmen and local politicians. Sidney Evershed was Mayor of Burton, before being elected Liberal MP for the constituency of Burton and Utoxeter. Of the first eight aldermen elected, six were brewers and their progressive attitude brought municipal enterprises such as gas, electricity and trams to Burton way ahead of many other towns. Burton printer J. Tresize's Burton Chronicle, first published on the 18th of October 1860, was the first successful attempt to bring the newspaper boom to the town. W. Wesley of High Street had been the first to try to introduce a paper to Burton, but his monthly Advertiser of 1842 lasted for only three editions. By the turn of the century, Burton had two daily newspapers, the Burton Evening Gazette, backing the Liberal Party, and the Burton Mail first published in 1898, supporting the Conservatives. The Evening Gazette continued until 1931, but the Burton Mail continues to this day. In the 1980s, it was purchased by the Birmingham Post and Mail Group, part of Yattenden Investment Trust, which still owns the newspaper. It now follows an independent political stance, remaining as a lively and popular outlet for news, views and opinions across Burton and South Derbyshire.
As for the Burton Chronicle, it continued until 1957, being incorporated into the Burton Observer and Chronicle, a paper which itself disappeared in the 1970s, to be replaced by the Burton Advertiser, one of several free newspapers circulating in the area. The dawning of the 20th century saw the arrival of the Burton Corporation electric tram system, and it was the Midland Railway Company who undertook the task of laying the lines. In 1903, the system was opened to the delight of Burtonians, who during the first eight months of production managed to clock up a total of 454,000 miles, carrying some 3,877,287 passengers from King Edward Place to Stapenhill, Winshill, Horninglow, Branston Road, Calais Road, Shopnell Road and Stanton Road. But the trams were not limited to Burton, for a line ran between Burton and Ashby via Swaddlingcote the Burton and Ashby Electric Light Railway. All trains were painted in the traditional Midland Red Crimson livery to complete the distance of 10 miles between the two towns, a journey that took over an hour. Throughout the tram's history, there was only one fatal accident, and this happened in the days before Burton Bridge was widened. The tram had started to climb Bearwood Hill, but some 200 yards up the hill, the tram started to run backwards. Some of the passengers managed to jump off before the tram, unable to negotiate the sharp bend, overturned. To tell the story of the Burton and Ashby Light Railway, here's local folk singer John Stewart. At the start of the 20th century, a tram line was laid by the Midland Railway. It ran up from Burton to Ashby Town. Ten miles up and down Hear the rattle of the wheels As they travel on their way On the Burton to Ashby Light Railway In the month of July 1906 The first train rumbled down The care company tracks through Winsel and High Bank to the Stanhope Red be cut, and down sunny side it would go. Hear the rattle of the wheels as they travel on their way on the Burton to Ashby Light Railway. Through New Hall to Swart past the company depot. Up by Woodhouse Crossroads to Woodville it would go To the boundary past Answell to Ashby it would pay A sixpenny fare you would pay Hear the rattle of the wheels as they travel on their way On the Burton to Ashby Light Railway In the year of 19 on that ill-fated day down Bearwood Hill, number 19 ran away From that time on the rule it was made Only four miles an hour down that grade Hear the rattle of the wheels as they travel on their way On the Burton to Ashby Light Railway For 21 years the cars are on the line but 1927 marked the end of the time On the 19th day of February the last car did run And the life of the trams now is done Hear the rattle of the wheels as they travel on their way On the Burton and Ashby Light Railway The first secondary school in the town was the Boys Grammar School, founded by Abbot William Bain in 1529. Little did the abbot know that a large, well-equipped 20th century comprehensive school would be named in his honour. Richard Alsop founded his charity school in 1729 for 30 poor boys. The government heralded a new era in education in 1833 with the introduction of a small grant to church and chapel schools. In 1834, the old grammar school building was replaced by this building in Friars Walk, still used for charitable and educational purposes. The boys' grammar school was rebuilt in Bond Street in 1877, and by 1911 the borough boasted some 19 elementary schools. Since the Second World War, another 18 new schools have been built. 
Further education in the town was fragmented until the opening of a technical college in 1955 to provide serious vocational courses. The familiar new building adjoining the War Memorial Gardens was opened in 1969. Other schools in the area are named after prominent local figures. Robert Sutton, the Catholic priest who was burned at the stake in Stafford in 1587. Dame Paulette, the great benefactress of the poor. In her will of 1593, she endowed almshouses which stood on the site now occupied by the central shopping precinct, although the stone door frame is preserved in the wall of Littlewood's store. Paget, Wolfric and de Ferris speak for themselves. Religion played an important part in Burton life and many new churches were built as the population increased with the growth of the breweries. The Methodist chapels were first to respond and the first was built in Horninglow Street where the magistrates courts stand today. A second was opened in 1871 on the corner of Union Street and Station Street. A large Baptist church was also built in New Street. Christ Church on Moore Street opened its doors in 1844 and this picture shows the children leaving its school on a Sunday. The church spire was badly damaged by the fold explosion in 1944 and had to be taken down. It's now an Elim Pentecostal church. St John's Church at Horninglow is famous nationwide for its iron bells. The Roman Catholic Church of St Mary and St Modwin in Guild Street, built in 1878 with its former school next door, has one of the most beautifully decorated interiors in the area. Church of St Modwin was built to replace the old Abbey Church so badly damaged during the Civil War. This Palladian style church opened its doors in 1725. The tombs in many of the churches illustrate another ancient local skill. Burton used to be famous for its alabaster carving known as Trent work. Every Burtonian must have seen the washlands and meadows in flood. But in 1875, the River Trent rose to record levels, causing severe flooding throughout Burton. A staggering £100,000 of damage was caused, and to ensure that it would never happen again, Burton was equipped with river defences and a flood embankment running along the west side of the river from Branston to Clay Mills. The first general infirmary in Burton was completed in 1869 to accommodate 25 patients built with voluntary donations and maintained by endowments. The second infirmary opened on the same site in 1899 with 72 beds. The pressure on staff must have been intense in those days. In 1900 a nursing staff of only one matron, three nurses and three trainees had to cope with 300 inpatients and 600 outpatients each year. The third infirmary, with 232 beds on the same site, was opened in 1942, with brewing families providing much of the funding. A new, modern hospital away from the noise and fumes of the town centre was planned. The first phase of the new district hospital was completed in 1971, and by 1993 all the services had been moved there, leaving Burton General Hospital redundant, to be demolished for redevelopment. At the outbreak of the First World War, many Burton men joined the North Staffordshire Regiment, whose 1st Battalion saw service in Flanders and France. The names of some 1,300 men who lost their lives were soberly inscribed on the oak panels of the town hall. One in every seven local families was bereaved. Burton became a centre for Belgian refugees. The town hall was converted into a hospital, and many larger buildings were used to accommodate troops. 
One notable figure for her efforts during the war was Mrs Lily Thomas, who organised the collection and dispatch of food parcels to Burton's 530 men who were held as prisoners of war. Into these parcels, Lily devised a code by which POWs could obtain authentic news of the war. Many women served as nurses, worked on the land or took over the jobs usually done by the men, such as maltsters and draymen. During the war, the government tried to discourage beer consumption, and this propaganda advertisement portrays brewers wasting the country's precious food resources. The duty on beer was raised more than sixfold, and a limit placed on production. The resulting shortage was so unpopular, however, that production was immediately increased, although the strength of the beer was weakened. Next to the war memorial is a plaque that commemorates William Coltman, the most highly decorated NCO during the war. Born in Rangemore in 1891, he served with the North Staffordshire Regiment in France and was mentioned in dispatches at the Somme in 1916. A committed Christian, he served as a non-combatant stretcher-bearer. Perhaps the most tragic event in the town was on the 30th of January 1916. A German Zeppelin, mistaking Burton for Liverpool, dropped its bombs on the town. Seeing the ensuing fire, two other Zeppelins dropped a total of 50 bombs, killing 15 and injuring 72 people, many of them in the Christchurch Mission Room. In 1915, work began on a machine gun factory near Branston, lying behind a long brick wall built by German prisoner of war labour. Peace reigned, however, before the factory was completed. After the war, it was used for the manufacture of aeroplanes, although the business hardly got off the ground, going bankrupt in two years. Cross and Blackwell transformed the factory during the 20s to manufacture their famous Branston pickle and Branston sauce. After production was later switched to London, it became the Branston Artificial Silk Factory, emitting pungent fumes from a 360-foot high chimney, believed to be the second highest in the country. With the closing imminence of the Second World War, the factory was requisitioned by the War Office to become an ordnance depot, which at its peak employed over 2,000 people. During the 1920s, cars were fast becoming a popular means of transport, and the corporation closed down the trams and switched to buses. By 1930, the corporation fleet consisted of one-man-operated single-deckers. In more recent years, Stevenson buses have become an increasingly familiar sight on our roads, culminating in a merger with the council transport department. As road transport increased, the breweries capitalised on the advantages it offered. The breweries once again hit the road. The brewery railway systems, which had once been predominant in Burton, were gradually dismantled, closing in 1967. Bass's first road lorry tanker was a Leyland, which had a 30-barrel capacity. Small fry compared to today's huge articulated brewery lorries. The breweries were also quick to spot the advertising potential of their vehicles. Many will remember the promotional vehicles such as cars shaped like beer bottles. The morning of the 3rd of September 1939 dawned bright and clear, but the fine weather could do nothing to dispel the cloud that hung over Britain. At 11.15am, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain broadcast to the nation. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The Second World War was a total war which affected all aspects of life. Engineering and foundry works became engaged in munitions work. Casualties were not as numerous as in the First World War, but the names of 350 servicemen and women killed were respectfully engraved alongside those of the First World War. 
There was no concentrated air raid on the town, but bombs dropped on the Uxbridge area in 1940 and Calais Road in 1941 caused several deaths and injuries. The WVS was formed in 1938 and County Borough organiser Molly Stanley, together with 1,200 local women volunteers, helped with such tasks as receiving the 4,000 refugee children sent from Birmingham and Chichester. This time, the government was more aware of the importance of the beer industry for maintaining morale and brewing was a reserved occupation. Ironically, the largest disaster of the Second World War for Burton was not due to enemy forces. On the morning of the 27th of November, 1944, explosives stored at the RAF maintenance unit at Fold, near Tutbury, blew up. The explosion made a crater 800 feet wide and 120 feet deep, and is said to have been the single most powerful explosion of the war, with the exception of the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Over one million tons of earth were blasted 11 miles into the sky, raining down dust that buried cattle in the surrounding fields. 81 people died as a result of the blast, which was felt for miles around. The cause of the underground explosion was never finally proved, but the court of inquiry held suggested that an airman, using a brass chisel to chip away the primary charge from a thousand pound bomb, detonated 4,000 tons of high explosives. The post-war period saw a rapid change in the appearance of the town centre itself. Many of the family-owned shops were unable to resist competition from multiple stores and the face of the High Street and Station Street began to change. Burton witnessed its industries diversify and expand. With advancing technology, the breweries were starting to rationalise their structure and reduce their land requirements within the town. The next stage in Burton's history was beginning to take form, with the accent on leisure time and other growing industries. Burton's first purpose-built shopping centre was the Bargate Centre, now the Riverside Centre, with its familiar rotunda. Burton Shopping Centre was opened in 1970 on derelict land behind High Street and Station Street as an open-air precinct, although work is now underway to refurbish and enclose it. Burton's first enclosed shopping centre, Worthington Walk, opened in 1988, linking the north end of the High Street with the central shopping area. The opening of the larger and more ambitious Octagon Shopping Centre in 1991 with its large car park offers a variety of new options for shoppers. The number of people shopping in Burton has risen from 60,000 to 150,000 over the last 35 years and new developments are continuously underway. The increasing volume of traffic in the 20th century brought the need for improvements to the town's roads. The old curving Burton Bridge had to be replaced with a newer straight bridge in 1860, but even this was becoming inadequate. An ambitious widening scheme was carried out between 1924 and 1926, during which some of the arches of the original bridge were uncovered. The curve of the road passing to Bearwood Hill was reduced to prevent a repetition of that earlier tram accident. The splashboards on the bridge were removed in the Second World War when metal was required from munitions. North-south through traffic was removed from the town with the opening of the A38 bypass in 1967. By the 1980s, the Burton Bridge was heavily congested and it was decided to build Burton's second river crossing. St Peter's Bridge was opened on Sunday the 30th of June 1985 and a carnival was held to mark its opening and to raise funds for local charities. The Iron Coop Brass Band were on hand to entertain. The 
The first car to cross the bridge was the Allsop's Lager Ball Nose Morris, belonging to Eind Coop. The man to cut the ribbon was Ein Coop Marketing Director Malcolm Wright, assisted by Councillor Ken Clark and Mr Archie Gentles. An estimated 15,000 people crossed the bridge on that day, but the wear and tear was on shoe leather rather than tyre rubber. A special flight was also arranged so that the fortunate could watch the opening from on high. had its fair share of variety artists and professional touring companies hosted at venues like the Opera House, now the Odeon Cinema, with its heavily decorated proscenium arch and panels filled with painted scenes where Fred Kelly and Charlie Chaplin sang. Operas, shows and plays were performed by local amateur groups, notably Burton Operatic Society. When moving pictures arrived, the Curzon Street roller skating rink was converted into a picture drone. Soon after this, the all-purpose electric theatre was built at 165 High Street, and the continuing boom saw another picture house open at Derby Turn. Shaftesbury House was originally used to accommodate the Young Women's Christian Association until being used for theatrical events. After such devout beginnings, it's perhaps ironic that the building now houses a nightclub. What was the picture drone showing? We can't show you a feature-length film, but let's take a look at some of the local company's advertising in 1932.
And on the menu, place some chips for one shilling and ninepence. Yes, that's less than 10p. I'll bet you wish you could still buy it for that. Planning the way forward for arts and entertainments in Burton today is the Brewhouse Arts Centre. Originally a union fermenting room built in 1867, it was kindly provided by Bass and has now been completely refurbished with the aid of a quarter of a million pounds raised by the local community. It now hosts local and national shows, music, theatres, exhibitions, classes and courses and has its own bar and bistro. Branston Water Park, a beautiful conservation area, was created on the site of an old gravel pit and now is the setting for a variety of water sports and angling. The old Burton Baths, erected in 1873 near the end of the bridge, were demolished to be replaced by the modern Meadowside Leisure Centre, which offers a wide range of sporting and leisure activities, a worthy replacement for the former public baths. Brewery firms in the town have not only provided benefits by way of their donations to buildings, but also by the sponsorship of many sports clubs and associations. The father of Midland Cricket, Abraham Bass, founded Burton Cricket Club around 1820. By the end of the century, the league was taken over by Burton Breweries Cricket. Basses, Salts, Worthingtons, Marstons and Allsops all competed for the Breweries Cup an annual tournament and played on Marston's ground. Burton Football Association claims to be the oldest in the county with teams regularly recruited from churches, industries and public houses. In fact at one time the town boasted two league sides, the Swifts and the Wanderers. Both world wars saw the decline of Burton football until 1950 and the establishment of Burton Albion. However, it's probably the 80s that have seen Albion achieve their greatest triumphs. In the 82-83 season, Albion won the League Challenge Cup, defeating Macclesfield Town 2-1 at Manchester's Main Road. The following season, Albion progressed to the third round of the FA Trophy, when they came face-to-face -face with First Division Leicester City. The match was played before a crowd of 22,500 fans at the baseball ground, but typical of the football violence that marred the 80s, a missile thrown from the crowd hit the Albion goalkeeper. Protests were made to the FA, and after an historic decision, the match was replayed behind closed doors, where Albion lost 1-0. But undoubtedly Albion's greatest success story is their trail to Wembley when they reach the final of the FA Trophy. Manager Brian Fiddler prophesied after the first round victory, we're going all the way to Wembley. And how true that speculation turned out to be. Albion arrived at Wembley on May the 9th, 1987, leaving behind the defeated teams of Weymouth, Whitley Bay, Maidstone United and Dartford to confront Kidderminster Harriers. So we're coming towards the end of the first half and it's a free kick to Burton Albion. It's crossed and Jim Arnold's coming for it. Oh, and only Pat's it and there's... Uh, a golden opportunity for Bob Gordon and really he did extremely well to take the ball on the volley as he did like that after one bounce but unfortunately couldn't maintain the direction and get it on goal. Nigel Sims to take the throw. Not a lot of options available to him. 
and in fact Dave Redford collects. Owen turns quickly and gets the ball in and there's a goalward shot from Paul Groves. Paul Groves facing... Uh, really the match was goalless after extra time and was replayed at the Hawthorns. Martin New getting good distance with that kick and I thought I saw a little bit of a nudge there by Bob Gordon on big number five Colin Brazier but nevertheless uh, Neil Dorset now on the left for Albion swings an early crossover and there's Paul Groves getting a header and that is a goal for Burton Albion the match only just one minute old and Burton Albion take the lead with that lovely cross coming over and Paul Groves the number seven and in fact we are finding that that goal has been disallowed and here's Paul Davis. he's got goal side of Steve Essex and here's chances for Kidderminster. Paul Davis homing to... Oh, and a bitter, bitter, cruel blow for Burton Albion. Oh, and here's an opportunity now because Paul Davis has had the ball flicked through to him and he's bearing in on goal. And uh, Martin New partially makes the save, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient and Paul Davis says that's probably enough to win the FA Trophy and he may well be right. Burton Albion coming in and there's a goal, number one, and that is a marvellous reply by Burton Albion, this tie has been excellent, Paul Groves coming in like an express train, met that left uh, wing cross and immediately the ball was in the back of the net. Well what drama, we are in the absolute dying stages of the FA Trophy final replay, we went to extra time at Wembley on Saturday, extra time would beckon if this was to go in, And a marvellous save by Jim Arnold. And Jim Arnold has saved the penalty and perhaps won the trophy for Kidderminster. Kidderminster Harriers finally won 2-1. But this was not to dampen the spirits of Burton Albion supporters. Their team had made it to Wembley. Burton Rugby Football Club dates back to 1870, when seven Burton players were in the Midland County side. Playing significantly for the first time on the club's home ground, Peel Croft, Burton defeated the first Maori touring side in 1889. The poplar trees planted at the ground are a memorial to ex-president of the club, Fred Sanster. By 1970, the club had provided one international player over 40 county caps and won the Staffordshire Cup. In the 92-3 season, the club was promoted to the Midland Courage League First Division. The River Trent has not only provided Burton with a means to develop its industrial wealth, but has also played a prominent part in the town's sport and pleasure. Three rowing clubs, all catering for different social groups, joined under the patronage of M.T. Bass to found the Burton Regatta, originally held on a Wednesday afternoon when the shops closed and a holiday-like atmosphere prevailed around the town. The regatta, now held on a Saturday and Sunday, maintains the atmosphere of a fun fair, combined with the opportunity for serious competition rowing for members of the Burton Leander Rowing Club and many others. But enough about Burton itself. Let's look at some of the areas which surround it. One of the oldest manors bequeathed to Burton Abbey by Wolfric Spot was Winnishell, or Winsill as it's now known. In days gone by, Winsill centred around a few farms, filling some of the best corn growing lands, hence the name Wheatley Lane. Between Ashby Road and Scalpcliffe Road was Hanging Hill, where the local gallows would stand. Winsill has always been part of Burton, yet has managed throughout the years to retain its own identity, largely due to its separation from the town by the river. Yet Winsill also has links with Newton Solney, for at the turn of the century the so-called rural half joined Newton and the town side joined Staffordshire. Winsill's growth centred around Bearwood Hill, where the large townhouses were constructed for the families of the well-to-do. New building developments took place after the Second World War, which stand in striking comparison to the hills and their well-known landmarks that bestride Winsill. Bladen Castle, built as a folly by a local solicitor in 1790. 
Next to this is Bladen House, home to the Gretton family and now an educational establishment. Much renovation has been carried out by the council in recent years, as this comedian pointed out. One familiar landmark that any traveller will recognise as he heads into Burton is the water tower built between the ancient boundary of Wins Hill and Stapen Hill on Waterloo Clump. It is this mock Norman style keep that maintains the water level pressure for the residents of Wins Hill. Keep following the skyline and your eyes meet the Gothic style church of St Mark which was built in the last century by one of the town's important dignitaries, John Gretton. Stapen Hill is in many ways similar to Winds Hill because of its location across the river where most of the suburbs growth has been fixed around St Peter's Street and Main Street. Again, Stapen Hill really came into its own after the Second World War with extensive building programs. Although the name Stapen Hill is Anglo-Saxon in origin, its foundations date back to prehistoric days. Recent excavations revealed a total of 36 bodies on the site of a pagan burial ground, along with everyday items such as knives and ornaments. The relics found in one of these graves are carefully laid out in the Bass Museum. Stapen Hill Recreational Gardens provide a pleasant backdrop and a quiet retreat from the town's bustling activity. The gardens were laid out in 1884 and ever since have given locals hours to enjoy the simpler things in life or on occasions more athletic pursuits. Another of the familiar landmarks are the distinctive cooling towers of Draclow Power Station which is capable of producing enough electricity to meet the needs of the population of Staffordshire. The first stage in the development, the A station, was completed in 1955 followed by the B station in 1960 and C station in 1966. A station continued operation until 1984 when it was closed, followed more recently by B station, leaving only C station in current operation. Draclo's history spans more than a thousand years. It was home to 28 generations of the de Gresley family who came here at the time of the Norman Conquest and included the famous railway engineer Sir Nigel Gresley, after whom this Pacific locomotive was named. Beautiful Parkland once surrounded Draclo Hall, a glorious Elizabethan mansion. The house and its contents were auctioned during the 1930s and after an unsuccessful attempt to establish a country club and raceway, the estate was demolished. Now only the entrance gates survive as a reminder of the former magnificence which once stood there. Over a thousand years ago, Tutbury existed as a small cluster of houses surrounding a fortified hilltop. Tutbury's size and importance increased after the Norman conquest. The Normans quickly realised the importance of its name, Tottersburg, meaning a fortified place, and seized the castle. In 1071, William I gave the castle to Henry de Ferrers, who below it founded a priory and the church we see today, although the priory has now disappeared. The church has stood almost unchanged since 1089. Visited by King John and Henry III, the castle passed to Henry's son Edmund, later to become the Duke of Lancaster, in due course passing to John de Gaunt. Richard II seized the castle in 1399, the year of his death, but the castle had already become crown property and the title Duke of Lancaster attributed to each successive reigning monarch. Henry IV and Henry VI also came to Tutbury, but probably its most famous visiting monarch was Mary, Queen of Scots, who was held at the mercy of Queen Elizabeth I three times. She communicated with the outside world with the help of a Burton brewer who smuggled letters in and out in empty beer casks. Tutbury was a royalist stronghold during the Civil War, but after their surrender, the castle was destroyed by Cromwell's troops. With a history steeped in blood and violence, it's not surprising that several ghosts are said to haunt the castle. One in particular is the Lady Margaret, child bride to Robert de Ferris. She was said to have met her lover in secret in the North Tower here. One night, she came out to find him slain in a pool of blood. She fled in terror and fell on the open sword of her steward, dying instantly. It's said now, that the ghost of Lady Margaret still haunts the North Tower. Not that I believe in those sort of things. But maybe... 
Tutbury began to prosper again during the 19th century with the foundation of a glassworks, supplemented by a plaster mill at the other end of the village and now a nature trail and a corn mill. The oldest in the area, mentioned in the Doomsday Survey and which continued in production until 1907. Recession hit Tutbury when the plaster mill moved to Roaster and Webb Corbett Crystal closed in the 1980s. Two new companies, Tutbury Crystal and Georgian Crystal, quickly rose from the ashes of the old glassworks and today Tutbury is a mecca for those interested in lead crystal, where the skilled craft of the glassblower can be seen at first hand. Four generations of the Chapman family have lived and worked at the corn mill since 1913, handcrafting sheepskin and leather goods. As your nose will tell you, Burton is without a shadow of a doubt still predominantly a brewing town. Although the town's production has risen to five million barrels a year, modern production methods have heralded a reduction in the workforce, as one man can now produce as many barrels as 30 men could in the last century. Family proprietors gave way to corporate ownership. Through a series of mergers and takeovers, Eind Coop and Allsops became Allied Breweries, then part of Allied Lions. Today, the Eind Coop Burton Brewery is a major part of a joint brewing company, Carlsberg Tetley. Bass joined with Mitchells and Butlers, and then Charrington's, to form the largest brewing group in the UK. With the opening of the new Bass Brewery, the only part of the old brewery still standing is the water tower, which stands 120 feet tall and carries an incredible 60,000 gallons of water drawn from the wells in the Trent Washlands and Meadows. Marston's expanded by mergers with other breweries, but has retained local management control. Chairman Mr Michael Hurdle is the great-grandson of its original chairman, Frederick Hurdle. Unlike many other towns and cities, Burton has adapted well to industrial change, and as old industries have declined, many new ones have risen to take their place. Burton has a large number of long-established manufacturing industries, forming a solid foundation to the town's commercial future. In recent times, the most significant blow to employment was the closure of car and then lorry tyre production at Pirelli near Stretton, with a loss of 1,150 jobs. Pirelli opened its first factory in the UK in 1929 on this 40-acre site donated by Burton Council. In contrast to the demise of Pirelli, the rise of the Technic Group PLC is one of Burton's greatest success stories in recent years. Founded in November of 1987 by Mr Phil Blood and Mr Tony Farmer, Tyre Technic started with eight staff working round the clock producing 2,000 performance retread tyres for cars and light transport vehicles each week. A second factory producing Eurospeed tyres was soon added to their Litchfield Road site. Environmental Tyre Control, which collects tyres for recycling, was opened on their new Wellington Road site, and a third car tyre factory began production there in 1994, following their takeover of Stirling Tyres. A fourth factory, Logistic Tyres, producing lorry tyres, will come online soon. From these humble beginnings, the company has now the capacity to produce a staggering 55,000 tyres a week and employs 300 people. 85% of production is exported throughout Europe, and in only seven years the group has twice won the Queen's Award for Export Achievement, presented in October of 1994 by His Royal Highness Prince Edward at the Technic Group's head office. Toyota built their new factory on the 580-acre site of the Berniston Airfield to supply the European market and are now producing 2,000 cars a week from this modern facility, employing over 1,700 people. 
Of course, no history of Burton-on-Trent will be complete without mentioning some of the 57 local watering holes. Last Orders has been called in numerous pubs and taverns over the decades, but there are a few whose ale and ambience has seen them stand the test of time. The Queen's Hotel, formerly the Three Queens, has been serving pints to many a weary traveller since its first licence was granted in 1531, which incidentally makes it the oldest licensed site in the town. One such fatigued wayfarer was reputedly Mary Queen of Scots, who rested here on her fateful journey from Chartley Castle to Fotheringham. Burton Marketplace is home to the Royal Oak, whose cellars were once the Abbey's dungeons. As tradition goes, the oak was built originally as a prison, but at its time, folk around Burton were so well behaved, there weren't any prisoners. High Street has had its fair share of alehouses, the longest standing being the Blue Post, which has been here since the 17th century. One curious feature of the Leopard Inn is the curved bays of different sizes. These date back to the time when the inn was part of the racking room of Charrington's Brewery and was thus equipped to deal with the varying sizes of casks. Finally, and by no means the least on our pub crawl around town, is the Swan Inn on the Trent Bridge, which has been at the centre of local debate for perhaps as many years as it stood here. Why? Well, some contest that its name derives from the swans that can be seen on the river, whereas others are prone to believe that it all stems from the first letter of the places that can be seen from here. Stapenhill, Winshill, Ashby, Newton. History has turned full circle with the establishment of Burton's most recent and smallest brewery, the Burton Bridge Brewery, which has its own showcase pub where you can still enjoy your pint in the atmosphere of times past. Opened in 1982, the brewery produces 50 barrels a week, supplying taverns throughout the country and winning numerous awards, such as the 1983 Camera Best Bitter Award. Burton-on-Trent has for centuries been the brewing capital of the world, and nowhere is this better preserved than at its famous Bass Museum. Open to visitors 362 days of the year, the Bass Museum guides you through centuries of Burton history. The Museum of Brewing charts the progress from its earliest foundation to modern times. Several historic vehicles are housed here. And of course, those wonderful Shire horses are stabled here. 1,000 years after those devout monks began brewing ale in Burton, the town continues to prosper from its brewing. A wide range of associated trades plus new industries attracted by a skilled workforce, a forward-looking approach and everything else this town has to offer. To complete your visit, a pint of fine draft ale in the museum's own bar. And here's to another thousand years of prosperity for the people of Burton-on-Trent. Cheers.